Okay, Mr. Landis here. Civil War Lesson 6, Part 6, here we go. Our question today, how did the Union's total war strategy impact the South? Right, total war. Hard topic, good topic, important topic for understanding how the war ends and war strategy. Here's what we're going to see. Total war as instituted by Grant to his generals in the South while he's fighting Lee in the North. Deprived, two things, deprived the Confederacy of supplies needed to fight, critical supplies such as food, ammunition, transportation, and here's a key too, at the same time, absolutely demoralized the citizens. It took their desire, their willingness, it sort of crushed their soul, if you will, right, um, in the way that he carried out total war um, through his generals in the South, which we'll see. Here's Grant's orders to his generals. Here's what he says. Remember, he's fighting Lee in, the, in Virginia. His orders to his generals in the South, fighting different parts of the South. Here's what he says. Leave nothing to invite the enemy to return. Destroy whatever cannot be consumed. Let the valley be left so that crows flying over it will have to carry their rations along with them. This is a direct order to General Philip Sheridan, who we're going to see in a second, who is carrying out war in the Shenandoah Valley. Here's a map of this directive. So here's Phil Sheridan with the most amazing hat and mustache war to the Civil War. His goal, I'll get my pen here, is to carry out warfare and destroy stuff all along here. This is often known as the breadbasket of the Confederacy. Remember, um, Grant is up here. He's trying to march toward Richmond. The Confederacy gets all their food and supplies from the Shenandoah Valley. It's very rich, okay? So Philip Sheridan is going to march through it. He's going to burn barns and take corn and wheat and cattle, and he's going to kill whatever he can take and essentially deprive the Confederacy of their ability to fight because they don't have any food. The more famous part of Total War takes place in the South with a man named William Sherman. Here he is. You don't want to mess with that guy, okay? Um, Sherman's primary objective is to march first to the city of Atlanta, which he's going to do. He's going to take the city of Atlanta. Um, uh, it's going to be a siege war. It's going to be uh, very costly um, in terms of some of the some of the um, structures of Atlanta. But 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 uh, un unlike what most uh, histories often report, the city of Atlanta itself did not really burn. Um, the military structure did, but that's because of the battle to take the city. Sherman did not light fire to the entire city. In fact, the 400 civilian homes that exist there were not touched. Okay, so it's important that we, we keep facts right straight and we, we look at what Sherman's approach was. Also remember that Atlanta was destroyed, uh, the munitions were destroyed, parts were destroyed because they resisted. Okay, so once Atlanta's taken, Sherman is going to institute total war and he's, he, his, a series of telegrams um, are really helpful to see how he his, his motivation and his psychological goals in doing it. Here's what he says. Until we can repopulate Georgia, it is useless to occupy it, but utter destruction of its roads, houses, and people will cripple their military resources. So here's the objective total war. Now when he says utter destruction of its people, he does not mean murdering and killing themselves. We'll hit on that later. What he's referring to is their, the, their food, their supplies, their resources, and also their spirits are going to be crushed. By attempting to hold the roads, we will lose a thousand men monthly and will gain no result. That's primarily because of a guy named Joe Wheeler, who is a Confederate cavalry officer, who is going to constantly be harassing right the Union soldiers. So the, the trying to hold roads is silly when guerrilla uh, guerrillas and uh, these cavalry guys can attack at any time and then ride away. I can make the march to Savannah and make Georgia howl. We have a very famous quote. We have over 8,000 cattle, 3 million pounds of bread, so tons of supplies. But we can forage, and this is the key we're going to see, forage the interior of the state. Forage, the forage party, okay, the special order 120, is going to be where Grant says every unit is going to have a bunch of foragers. They called them bummers, and their job, as the main army fanned out, their job, when the, sorry, was in a column, the bummers are going to fan out and be basically find, steal, hunt for food, cattle, stuff, and take whatever they can find and light some stuff on fire. That's sort of the more famous part of Total War. So here's an animation. Grant's going to divide his army, sorry, Sherman's going to divide his army up. They're going to march. He's going to divide in multiple columns. There's very few actual battles fought along this way. And this is where we have the famous foraging. These bummers are going to take stuff, light barns on fire, um, you know, destroy some houses, and things like that. The question is, to what degree was there actual things like murder, rape, pillaging? That's a good question. We're going to address that. Uh, um, incidentally, Sherman at West Point was voted most likely to light everything on fire. That was his class award, 1840. Uh, incidentally, Lee was awarded most likely to secede. Boom! Secession joke. Nailed it. Images of Sherman here and his men. This is a back-breaking labor to destroy transportation supplies. You've got these men hiking up these railroad ties, right, to destroy them so the army can't use them. Um, 
they would pile them together, light them on fire. They had actually had a special way to do this, and they would bend them both around trees, and they had the special tool to haul them. Very sophisticated, very difficult to destroy this um, transportation structure. A very famous image here by an artist named James E. Taylor, right? And this is sort of what people think of when they think of Sherman going through the South. You've got here um, the destruction of property. These are pigs that they're killing. Um, there's this idea of sort of wanton destruction. And, um, you know, there's no actual murder of civilians in this image, but this is sort of what people conjure up. And the question that we have to ask is, okay, um, to what degree was this happening? Um, what records do we have? Was there murder? Was there rape? Were there terrible things of war that exist? And here's what we know. A quote from Civil War Trust um, from their report on Marsh of the Sea. Here's what the, um, the author says. Whether it was a plantation manor, a more modest white dwelling, or a slave hut, any residence encountered by these bummers, that's the foragers, stood a chance of being utterly ransacked. That's the, that's the majority of what was happening. Barns, gardens, and farms were overrun, although many of the houses were damaged, and a minority put to the torch and totally destroyed, so minority. Others were left essentially untouched in unpredictability that became a great source of fear. So this is the this is the psychological goal of Sherman, remember, demoralize by stealing, taking, overrunning, some lighting. But again, this idea of wanton rape and murder and destruction is just not true. Here we have um, Sherman himself saying this, no doubt many acts of pillage, robbery, and violence were committed by these parties of foragers. I have never, though, heard of any cases of murder or rape. Now, does that mean that no rape or murder ever happened? Of course not. These things happen in war. They're often unreported because of shame. But there is very little evidence to support that there was widespread indiscriminate murder and rape during the March of the Sea. In fact, there's more evidence to support that the destruction, believe it or not, was rather limited to certain groups of people, these bummers, and certain instances during this March of the Sea. Ironically, as Sherman gets to Savannah, right? Remember, that's his goal. He gets to the sea. The city surrenders. Guess what? He's all of a sudden Mr. Nice Guy. He has a band play for the city. There's actually a dinner party. This is unbelievable. Read this quote with me. In escaping Savannah, several Confederate generals left their wives and children to Sherman's per personal protection. They, they left their wives and children to the enemy general's protection. And he took this responsibility seriously. Despite laughing, the Confederates were willing to leave their families in the care of someone they considered a brute. So this sort of dispels this idea that that Sherman was this barbarous murderer encouraging all sorts of you know wanton rape and terrible things and destruction. Although, to be clear again, it is certainly possible that there were cases of that, but it is important that we have no evidence that this was indiscriminately widespread. Now, as Sherman then turns north to South Carolina to continue through the Carolinas, his destruction and foraging, things pick back up. In fact, here's an image. Things were worse in South Carolina. South Carolina is the seat of the start of the war, and so there is a lot of evidence that there was sort of more revenge and vindication taken out on the Carolinas, including the burning of Atlanta. Now, did Sherman set fire to the city of Atlanta? We have no evidence of that. Here's what we have Sherman saying later in life, though I never ordered it, the burning of Atlanta, sorry, I'm the burning of South Carolina, um, of Columbia, and I never wished it. I have never shed any tears over the event because I believed that it hastened what we fought for, the end of the war. This goes back to point number, right, one and two. Deprive supplies, right, ability to fight, break the spirit of the citizenry. And that is the key of total war. Um, Sherman in pop culture, you can buy a William T. Sherman onesie. Also, they have many, many memes. The best defense is good offense, and the best offense is fire, right? Also, Sherman, General Sherman, oops, I missed a house. Okay, my face is covering that. I'm sorry. Um, Sherman today is still reviled in many parts of the country, especially you can imagine different pockets of the South because of the destruction that took place. The question before you is, was he cruel and a warlord or was he a determined realist? These are questions we can argue today and you'll do so in an optional activity about Sherman's explanations for why he decided to burn several things in Atlanta and take the city. Our question today, we asked, how did the Union's total war strategy impact the South? Total war deprived the Confederacy of supplies needed to fight, food, um, military supplies, ammunitions, weapon depots, transportation, and equally important, it demoralized the citizens. It absolutely crushed and broke their souls. And that is what we saw primarily through Sherman's march, right, through the sea and, to the, and through the Carolinas. I'll see you next time.